Assalamu alaikum, and may the peace of God be upon each and every one of you. Welcome to Gems for the Traveler. My name is Imam Muhammad Abdul Aziz. I work at the Salam Center in Sacramento, California. In this series, we explore the different facets and the different names and attributes of God Almighty. This is the month of Ramadan, and Muslims come to the mosque in order to learn, in order to grow spiritually, and connect with their Creator. In this series, we attempt at learning more about God through studying His names. I invite each and every one of you to join us on this beautiful journey to learn more about the qualities and the attributes of the Creator of heavens and earth. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, tonight, inshallah, we uh, discuss uh, yet another name of the names of Allah. And um, I was just informed that uh, we've had so far how many khatiras? 14. So we uploaded 14 khatiras on our website. And, and it's just, it, it's, it's amazing that two weeks have already passed in Ramadan. I mean, I, I personally, and I'm here every night, I can't believe that two weeks, two full weeks, 14 days, have already passed in the month of Ramadan. And Allah, brothers and sisters, I promise you, uh, the remaining 14 days will pass just like that. So uh, let us, inshallah ta'ala, take advantage of whatever it is that we learned so far uh, and, and put it to action in the, uh, in the remaining 14 days of Ramadan. And before I address uh, tonight's Allah's name, um, I would like, again, inshallah ta'ala, to just make sure that we remember all the names that we have covered so far. So I want two people uh, uh, each one will basically give me six, at least six names, inshallah, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other person will give me the other six. So that's 12, not 14, just to make it easier. All right, any volunteers? Yes? Yes? Okay, that's enough, little sister. Zagum al takbir. Pass this to the sister, inshallah. All right, any other brothers who'd like to volunteer? That's her brother. <laughs> you guys share the chocolate, okay? Let me get another one. Any of the adults would like to uh, share six or seven of Allah's names with us? Come on, guys. Oh my God, this is totally unacceptable. Any of the sisters would like to uh, volunteer? How about five, just, uh, uh, just five names of Allah? Make them 10 or 11? Good. In addition to the ones that the sister uh, mentioned. Five new ones. Uh, tonight, inshallah, the name of Allah, that I plan to cover is, is uh, profoundly associated with one of the most important and most significant and most fundamental acts of worship of the month of Ramadan. And it's not fasting. What is the act of worship in Ramadan that is even more important than fasting itself? Not as zakah. It's very important. Salah is very important. Huh? Qiraat al-Qur'an is extremely important, something that is more important than that. And niyyah is, is extremely important than that we do at the very beginning of Ramadan. One more, there's the one more, the only one that you guys left. Al-Dua, who said al-Dua? Zakallah khair, musketeers for this guy. That's it over. Al-Dua. I said that al-Dua is the single most important act of worship in the month of Ramadan. In fact, Ramadan itself is structured in a way that facilitates your prayer, that facilitates your dua, right? In your salah, it brings you closer to Allah. Your salah is about that moment that you spend with Allah in your sujood. That is the most important moment in your salah. You are in the nearest state, and the closest state to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're making sujood. Why? Because we do what when we make sujood? We make dua, we ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you're fasting, the Prophet tells us in the hadith that there is a, a few moments 
in which your dua will be accepted right before you break your fast. It's as if the fasting day leads up to that moment where you are in the purest of states and you are positioned in a way where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually listens to your prayers and answers your dua. Right. And I wanted to, uh, again, now that I've given you the introduction, anyone who would like to guess what is it, Allah's name that we talk about tonight that is so much, so profoundly related to a dua? Al Mujib. MashaAllah, I think. I think I have a couple of more. Who said that Mujib? Zakallah <laughs> here's, here's one for Al Mujib and pass this over to a couple of brothers. Right, Brother Farooq and the guys over there. Any of the sisters said Al Mujib? Alright, two for the sisters right here. Alright, and one last one for Brother Naaman because he keeps working so hard. Allah's name Al Mujib. <clears throat> What is Al-Mujib? What is the meaning of Al-Mujib? Al-Mujib from Ajaba, and Ajaba is to answer, right? A question in Arabic is su'al or mas'ala. Answer in Arabic is ijaba or jawab. And Al-Mujib is the one who responds, is the one who answers. And we know of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Mujib is the one Excuse me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-Mujib is the one who listens to the prayers, hears the supplications, and responds favorably, and bestows ni'mah. He bestows blessings. He answers your prayers, and he gives you disproportionate to what you asked for. You see how al-Mujib is connected with a shakur Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, and he responds with his shukr. So Mujib comes before a shakur And if Allah promises us that He is Al Mujib, the one who answers our prayers, should we worry about our prayers being not answered? We should not worry. We should pay so much attention to the act of making dua, to the act of praying itself, and I'm not talking about the five daily prayers. I am talking about to sit down and to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to lay it out to him and to share with him your issues and your challenges and, and your agony and your pain and your depression and your needs and to speak to him subhanahu wa ta'ala Umar ibn Khattab used to say inni la ahtammu bil hijab la ahtammu bima'na yani la yusibani alham I don't worry myself about answering getting my prayers answered though innama ahtammu bil su'al I get myself worried about the act of asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِذَا أُلْهِمْتُ السُّؤَالِ عَلِمْتُ أَنَّ الْإِجَابَةَ تَأْتِي مَعَا Once Allah guides me to actually speak to him and to pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala, I realize that I'm in, a, in the proper state and Allah guides me to talk to him. That means he actually plans to answer my prayers. Let me ask you a question. Do you really expect that whenever you ask Allah something, that He will give it to you right away? Some of us do. Some of us do. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not give you what you want, well, how do you feel? You feel depressed, maybe frustrated, disappointed. I made dua so much and Allah did not give it to me. Again, it's an expectation that we have. Whenever we make dua, because Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِذَادِ عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ قَرِيبٌ doing what? أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا When my worshippers ask you about me, I am so near to them, and I will answer their prayers. So why are you not answering them? Let me give you an example. Children who ask their parents for things, and every time the child asks of something, parents give it to them. What do we call that relationship? Spoil, right? We say that parents spoil their children when they give them everything they want. Do you want Allah to spoil you? It will be nice, actually. <laughs> Allah spoiling us, that would be great. But is it good for us? No. Why? Because, again, I, I, I kept giving you examples about children and their fathers and their mothers in the month of Ramadan, children and their parents. I keep giving, bringing up that example because it really demonstrates our relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It demonstrates it in a very beautiful way. When, when you're a five-year-old 
at the store keeps asking, I want this, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that, can you get me this, can you buy that? Why don't you just give everything that your child asks for, why don't you just give it to them? And save yourself the trouble. Because it's not good for them most of the time. They're asked, they don't know what they want. And then they have a, a you know, very short attention span. So they see something, oh my God, I want this. And then they see something, oh, I want that. So if you keep giving them everything they ask for, you know, first of all, you're going to go bankrupt. <laughs> and, and file for bankruptcy. Second of all, you're doing tremendous injustice to your children. Because they don't think and plan and process and really like spend so much time. And then they ask you, okay, I want that particular kind of candy. After thorough research, I realized that that particular kind of candy is what's good for me. Huh? How much time did you spend on this? Well, I've been thinking about it for weeks. It took a massive toll on me. That would I'll be prepared to give it to my child. But do we actually do that? No. We act on impulse. We want something. Ya Allah, please help me with this. Ya Allah, give me that. Ya Allah, I want this. Ya Allah, I want that. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you everything you want, anytime you ask for it, you actually will just get yourself in trouble. So always think about that when answering the dua is delayed. Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala has a better plan for you. He has a better plan. And if we don't worry ourselves with al-ijabah, with answering our, our dua, we worry ourselves about our relationship with al-Mujib. To talk to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's what matters at the end of the day. And Allah made it so easy for us, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Imagine if you only can go to Mecca in order to pray. Prayer anywhere else in the world is just simply not accepted. How difficult would that have been? Imagine if you have to come to the masjid in order to make dua. So you can't make dua at home. Imagine if it's one hour a day, like, okay, prayers will be accepted, the gates of heaven will be open from 5 to 6 p.m. every day. Any other time of the day, you know that you're just wasting your time because there's no one else on the other end of the channel, right? Imagine if there is an intermediary between you and Allah. Someone such as myself. You have to come to me and your prayers need to go through me and then I relay them to Allah. And a small cost. You have to pay for it. You think it's a laughable matter, right? Europeans for hundreds of years, this is how they lived. They used to buy indulgences from the church. They used to go to their Catholic priests and ask them uh, for pieces of real estate in heaven. And in return, they get uh, prayers for their kids that are sick and for their business that, that is about to, to be shut down, right? Imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subjects to such humiliation. And then you have a sign in the masjid that says, uh, you know, buy one, get one free. You purchase one prayer for your child, you get a prayer for the second child automatically for free. I mean, this is, you're laughing about this, but this is how people functioned for hundreds of years. It was real. It was real for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically he says, Qareeb, inni Qareeb, I am near you, I am close to you. You don't need anyone. You don't need a particular time, a particular location, a particular place. It doesn't matter. Imagine if people can only make dua one person at a time. Or there is a... a, 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 a a recorded message that says your dua will be answered in the order in which it was received. <laughs> right? Imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a committee of angels that record your prayers and then they uh, basically discuss those prayers later on with the Lord, right, at their convenience. And then you have to wait for your turn to come. And then when other people are making dua and you try to make dua, uh, 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 in a minute, in a minute, your turn will come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it so easy for you to pray because he is Al-Mujib. And Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who answers the prayers, actually helps you understand other names as well. It helps you understand the meaning of Alim and Khabir, the all-knowing and the all-encompassing in his knowledge. It helps you understand the meaning of Sami' and Basir, the all-hearing and the all-seeing. Why? Because there are hundreds of millions of people that are praying for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time. And he's able to hear every single prayer. 
and see every single heart and have an all-encompassing knowledge of every person's circumstances and what they're going through and what they need and what is good for them and what is bad for them and what he needs to do for them in a day or a month or a year. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of a sudden when you say as-sami'u al-basir, the all-hearing and the all-seeing, now it feels different. It tastes different. And it's, it's so interesting because it's not just about us, human. Right? It's not just about us, it's about other creation that prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Right? There are millions and millions of, of, of other uh, creatures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought to this, to this world that also pray to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ants pray, the fish pray, mountains and stars and, and bacteria and all kinds of stuff, they're all praying to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala at the same time. And he, that Mujib, is able to listen to all of this and process all of this information. And I want to point out, inshallah ta'ala, an incredible hadith. And in this hadith, the Prophet sallam says, لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَكْرَمَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مِنَ الدُّعَاءِ There is nothing that is more honored and dignified in the sight of Allah than dua. Why? Because dua is a testimony that you surrender to the Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you take Him as an entity that will actually be able to help you. That you trust Him. That you rely on Him and depend on Him. That you trust what's in His hands more than your own plans, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I, I, that's why I really think that you need to take it very seriously, brothers, to your prayers. Not just the five daily prayers. I am talking about just sitting down and talking to Allah. Wallahi, those of you who are very religious and they come to the masjid on a regular basis and make dua, they'll be shocked when they hear me say, most people don't talk to Allah. Most people don't talk to God. It's awkward for them, they don't know what to say. And, and this is one of the reasons we, we started this series. I just wanted us, again, to ease up to the concept of talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to have vocabulary to use when we talk to Him. He gets angry and upset when people don't speak to him. The Prophet says, مَن لَمْ يَسْأَلِ اللَّهِ غُضِبَ عَلَيْهِ If you don't ask of Allah, He will be angry with you. Why? Because when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means that you think He is actually capable of helping you. But when you profess Islam, or you are a man or woman of faith, and you say, I believe in God, but all of your affairs, you're always going to other human beings to resolve them for you. What kind of faith is that? I mean, you're saying it, but you're not acting upon it. Imagine if you're sitting in a meeting, and this meeting has people of authority. You have the governor, and you have the city councilmen, and you have uh, the sheriff, and you have this, and you have that. And then you get in trouble for one reason or another. And rather than asking them to help you, you go to your little brother, your seven-year-old brother. Muhammad, please help me out. I have a problem at school. I'm being harassed and there, there's religious bigotry against me because of my Muslim-sounding name. Muhammad, I know you're my seven-year-old brother, but I need your help. And the governor is sitting there, and the sheriff is sitting there, and the city councilwoman is sitting there. What is wrong with this guy? He excludes all these people of authority and power who can actually do something for him and going to a weak human being, weaker than him, and ask for his help. See? This is exactly how it is. When we keep asking of each other, all dependent, weak human beings, and, and we neglect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala al-Mujib, who is actually the only one that's capable of helping you, this is why he gets angry. When you ignore praying to him. And again, said earlier, Allah makes it again, and Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants to answer your prayers, so He makes it so easy for you to pray. There's no designated time to pray. There's no designated language to pray. Imagine if you only have to pray in Arabic. Right? Imagine. And then you say, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not accept your dua. Just because you're not saying it right. Imagine if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires that you make dua with eloquence, that you have to be eloquent and use poetic descriptions. It's like this man that came to the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, inni la ujidu dandanataka wala dandanata mu'ad. 
I'm not good, you know, using the nice poetic fashion of prayer that that that, that rhymes, that is so beautiful. And, and it sounds like a nice murmur, like it sounds like it has this musical touch to it. Like you and Mu'ad in Jabhat too. I, I just, I'm not good at that. So he says, okay, what do you say in your prayers? He says, you know, إِنِّي أَسْأَلُ اللَّهَ الْجَنَّةَ وَأَسْتَعِيذُ بِهِ مِنَ النَّارِ All I do, Ya Allah, I ask you for your heavens and, and I seek refuge in you from hellfire. And the Prophet ﷺ smiles and he said to them, فَوَاللَّهِ حَوْلَهُمَا يُذَنَّبِهِ Around those two concepts, we do all our beautiful poetic prayers. Yes, we use complex language, but you use the language. You know, you sit down with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and use your primitive, basic, colloquial language and just speak to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala in your native language. And people, again, they bring up this idea all the time. They come to me. Okay, is there a dua for this illness or a dua? for going to take my uh, LSAT, or a dua because I have my driver's test coming up, or a dua because I'm getting married soon. And then when I say, just ask Allah to help me with your driving test. And they say, well, is there a dua in Arabic for that? <laughs> and I'm like, SubhanAllah, I mean, what is Allah going to say? Like, oh, that's English. Ah, I can't hear that. Stop. What is he going to say, subhanAllah? I mean, are you suggesting that Allah only understands Arabic? That if you say it in English, that he won't understand? This is false. Yes, the Qur'an was revealed in Arabic and it preserves the language. And the language preserves it, sure. And we honor and cherish that. And that's why we memorize the Qur'an. That's why we use the Qur'an in our structured prayers. We do it in Arabic. But that only takes like a half an hour every day. Every other time you speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, speak from the heart, use your own language, right? And the beauty of that is that you don't have to be extremely detailed either. Because again, Allah, Al-Alim, Al-Khabib, He knows. So you don't have to go through all the absolute details. Uh, ya Allah, on January 25th, I was driving on Highway 5 South, southbound, and then I was pulled over at 11.55, 43. You don't have to do that, right? And then I was given a ticket. Okay, I need to explain what a ticket is. So a ticket, <laughs> do you need to do that? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. He knows what's in your heart. He obviously created the world, so he knows everything about it. On the other hand, you cannot be terse and very like limited in your language either, so you just carry the ticket. Take care of this. So you have to communicate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's the whole point, right? Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to listen from you, and he imposes no limitations whatsoever on the manner, on the place, on the timing, on the circumstances by which you approach him. Imagine if he only listens to righteous people and he doesn't listen to sin. Imagine if you have to make wudu before you pray, alhamdulillah. We have no such limitations whatsoever, we never we have to speak to Al-Mujib subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I would like, inshallah ta'ala, to conclude the khatira by just giving you really simple tips to maximize the opportunity of your dua and your prayers being answered. Because again, it matters, it still matters to us. I keep saying it shouldn't matter, but for many of us, your prayers matter. And, and you have urgent and immediate needs. And I acknowledge that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does as well. Follow some of these tips. Number one, al yaqeen al rijal you have to be certain that Allah is capable of answering your, your prayers. You cannot ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this like apologetic tone. Ya Allah, would you do this for me? Would you forgive me? Like you're not, you're not, it's not a question, right? It's not a question. Ya Allah, forgive me. Please, I beg you, I implore you, forgive me. Would you be able to forgive me about after all this? I mean, tell me, just be honest with me. This is not the way we're supposed to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to have yaqeen, certainty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable and inshallah will answer your prayers. Right? Number two, al-khushu'ah, wa tadalli. You have to be in a state of humility when you speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You cannot give orders. Ya Allah, help my son. You have to do it with humility and surrender to Allah. 
confess your own mistakes and speak to him and, and literally say, Ya Allah, I know. I know what I do and I know my heart is corrupt. And I know that I don't deserve that my dua is answered. And I know I'm sinful. And I know I'm weak. And I know I come to you and ask for your forgiveness and two days later I make the same mistake again. But I also know that your rahmah, that your compassion are much greater than all of that. And I know that I still have a place in your kingdom. And I know that your love will even encompass a sinner such as myself. And I know that I am not perfect and I can't be perfect no matter how much I try. But I also know a lot more that you are loving and compassionate. Sometimes, Allah, brothers and sisters, you make dua and you are denying yourself. You say to Allah, Ya Allah, if you don't do it for me, do it for people that love me. Do it for my mother. Do it for people that trust me. Do it for my son that is still young and, and is pure and should not be held accountable for my iniquities. Use whatever you can in order to convince Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you deserve this rahmah at that moment of, of humility, of khushu'a, brothers and sisters. And of course there are, there's other guidance as well that the Prophet sallallahu he puts us in the right direction when, when it comes. Take advantage of the beautiful seasons of dua. Al-Mujib is always ready to hear what you have to say, but in those seasons he's even more ready. And he's even more willing. Hajj, Ramadan, right after Adhan, when you're making sujood, right after you finish your wudu, right? In the middle of the night, before Fajr, at sunset, right before sunset, when it's raining, when you're traveling, right? When you're sick, when there is someone who's pious and righteous, ask them to make dua for you, right? Take advantage of those beautiful times and instances and circumstances. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Mujib, the one and only that answers the prayers, I ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept us, to answer our prayers, and, and, and to uh, forgive our mistakes and inequities and, and shortcomings. And I ask Him to treat us with His rahmah, with His compassion and love, uh, and not with His justice. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us acknowledge Him as the utter and most absolute truth of this universe. I ask Allah to gather us in His Jannah. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Gems for the Traveler. Uh, if you have any questions about the material you just watched, or if you would like to come to Salam in order to join us for one of the services, please visit our website at www.salamcenter.org, or you can visit my Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash Imam Aziz. I hope that this episode touched your hearts spiritually as it did ours. God bless you all. Thank you.